I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Moore College once again to the annual lectures for 2018, which are being brought to us by Dr. James Healy Hutchinson. And uh, we look forward to the instalment today in the series on the Psalter, answering the, Sol the Psalmist's perplexity, New Covenant Newness in the Book of Psalms. I'm George Athos. I'm a member of the faculty here in the Old Testament department, and I'm your MC for today's session. Well, my colleague Dan Wu likened the earlier parts of James's lectures to a flight in the exciting stages of takeoff. And my other colleague Andrew Sheed likened the lectures to the preparation of some delicious dishes by a celebrity French chef. Well, the temptation now is for me to combine the two analogies and liken James' lectures to aeroplane food. <laughs> I'm going to resist that temptation because James has certainly not given us a bland meal with plastic cutlery and cramped conditions. Instead, I'm going to uh, draw an analogy from another field entirely, one that is close to my heart archaeology. It's like the Psalter is a fantastic mound, the tell of an ancient city. And James has come all the way from Belgium with spade of exegesis and trowel of biblical theology, and he's invited us to start digging with him. And it's been quite a joy. And what we've unearthed as we've been doing our digging is the apparent failure of the Davidic Covenant in Stratum 3, Book 3 of the Psalter. Psalm 89, which closes Book 3, presents us with the downfall of the nation of Judah and the dynasty that ruled it, the Davidic dynasty, and the seeming failure of God's chesed, his commitment to his covenant promises. It's like we've found the ruins of a destroyed temple, in the midst of this ancient city with its shattered walls and columns strewn about the layer with evidence of a fiery conflagration. And theologically, this has led us to ask, how can God still be faithful to his covenant commitments when we find the ruins of the Davidic covenant like this? And so James has taken us digging even further. Yesterday, we came to Stratum 4, Book four of the Psalter. And here our spade and trowel unearthed monuments to the Exodus, that great event which signalled the commencement of Israel's national life. But even more significantly, we found that these monuments were all based on one solid plinth, a foundation of the Abrahamic covenant. And despite the breakages that we've seen in the Davidic covenant of later strata, we see the Abrahamic covenant completely intact. And as we've got out our brushes and delicately swept aside all the caked up dirt and dust, James has led us to discover the floor plan of this ancient city. That in book four of the Psalter, the Abrahamic covenant was evidence that God intended to deal with the deeper problem of human sin the very problem that led to the collapse of the Davidic structure of the later stratum. And so James concluded, uh, book four of the Psalter was aiming to show that God had not reneged on his covenant commitment to David. Instead, the Abrahamic covenant shows us that God intended to fulfil his covenant commitment to David by dealing with the problem of sin something that the new covenant looks forward to. And so today, we come to Stratum 5, Book 5 of the Psalter, in our archaeological mound of the Psalter. Now, before I invite James up to address us, uh, some housekeeping matters. There are outlines which are floating around, and if you would like a hard copy of the outline, please pop your hand up and one of our ushers will supply you with one. The outline is also available uh, for download, and those of you who are joining us 
via live stream also have access to it uh, via the relevant links on the live stream website. Um, like me, can I ask you to pull out your phones and please just double check that you have it on silent. I am going to flip mine over right now and that will be most helpful. Uh, a warm welcome to those who are joining us via live stream. It's good to have you along remotely uh, following on. Uh, there will be a chance for all of us, including those joining via live stream, to ask questions after James's lecture today. Uh, we'll receive questions from the floor. Uh, if you're uh, joining us via the live stream and you do have a question, you can ask via the live stream chat and that will then be relayed here and will be asked of James after his lecture. Uh, a reminder also that there are, there's an opportunity to write down questions if perhaps you don't have the opportunity to ask one during question time today, or you'd prefer simply to um, address it to James via writing. Uh, the box, question box is over there to my left uh, for you to use that, and this will be the last time that that's available as tomorrow is our final lecture. Uh, for those who need some extra space, uh, there is overflow uh, uh, situation in the uh, Luke and William rooms. Sorry, Luke and William's room. Uh, so please avail yourself of that if you need to. Morning tea will be served also after our lecture and question time today. I'm going to read the Bible. James has asked us to read Psalm 110. I'm reading from the ESV, Psalm 110, a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way, therefore he will lift up his head. Please join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this part of your scriptures that you inspired to be written for our benefit. We thank you also for James and his efforts uh, in your word. We thank you for his research and his willingness to share uh, that with us. We pray that we all may be encouraged by what he has to say to us today, that our questions will also be of encouragement to him. And we pray that as a result of having heard the exposition of your word, that we might be encouraged in our understanding of you, that we might grow in our knowledge of you, grow in our love, our faith, and our hope. This we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Would you please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. James Healy Hutchinson to the lecture. Well, if you'll allow me to move beyond brief, just briefly, uh, once again, um, I'd be immensely grateful if you felt able to help yourself to a free Belgian Bible Institute pen. Um, this would not be to rival Moore College or anything of the kind, but um, it might just lead to the odd um, arrow prayer for us. We would be so grateful for any uh, support uh, in prayer of that kind, but feel free to take one whether or not you have any intention of praying. Um, <laughs> and if you are French speaking, uh, please help yourself to a magazine as well, or if you know somebody who is. Thank you. Some questions uh, put to me yesterday regarding the Levitical Covenant. 
Uh, it was always my understanding, says the questioner, that Nehemiah 13, verse 29, which you described as a summary of this covenant, was referring to the covenant that uh, the people themselves make in chapter 10. Why take it more broadly than this, although I concede that these are linked in chapter 10? What is the significance of the Le Levitical focus in Nehemiah? Uh, also, how does 1 Samuel 2, verse 25, fit in into this enduring Levitical covenant. Thank you very much. Uh, I didn't actually say that Nehemiah 13.29 is a summary uh, of the covenant, uh, but it's nonetheless a good question. Um, and uh, yes, in Nehemiah 10, uh, the people make covenant commitments regarding uh, the Sabbath, regarding uh, marriage, uh, regarding the temple which are then broken in chapter 13, where, where the verse in question uh, appears. The questioner's presupposition here uh, seems to be that these covenant commitments are new relative to what has already been prescribed in the law of Moses. And at that point, our paths diverge. I'd just like to show you that from uh, Nehemiah. Let's see if we can find that uh, together in uh, chapter 10. Nehemiah 10, verse 28. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, the Torah their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his rules and his statutes. Um, verse 34, similarly, we, the priests, the Levites, and the people have likewise cast lots for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God, according to our fathers' houses at times appointed year by year, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law. And same phrase that comes back uh, in verse 36. Uh, the, the 1 Samuel 2 uh, question uh, I'm almost certain that the question means verse 35. Uh, and uh, indeed, well, let's uh, uh, have a read of that uh, too. 1 Samuel 2, verse 35. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart uh, and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. So this faithful priest is distinct from the anointed, and in the first instance may well be Samuel, uh, later 1 Kings 2, uh, 35, Zadok. Um, but as the questioner is probably implying, uh, we should see a, a fulfillment on a, a further horizon, um, which we will be indeed coming back to uh, a little later on today. I was unsure as to whether Adam Hensley, the um, uh, lecturer who, um, whose doctoral dissertation was on covenant relationships in the Psalter, I was unsure of where uh, he's based. I suggested Adelaide. I was right about that, but the um, particular name of the college, Australian Lutheran College, if that's of interest. And uh, that same day, um, I uh, quoted incorrectly off the cuff um, the name of a uh, book. If uh, Dr. Bray is here and other francophones, I, if you've noted down the name of that book, um, substitute the word uh, structure for composition. Um, question, uh, could you please comment on Psalm 2 verse 7 in your notes you say, 
Whereas in Psalm 2 verse 7, David's son speaks to Yahweh. Is David's son the Messiah, i.e. Jesus? Um, yes. Uh, Acts 13 verse 33 uh, and elsewhere. Uh, Matthew 3, 17, Jesus' baptism, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased indeed. Another example of that, I want to say amen uh, to uh, that uh, questioner. I did uh, let the cat out of the bag, if you were following closely, when I said that uh, Jesus was fantastic. Um, uh, but you will also have understood that I'm trying not to be guilty of flattening the contours of redemptive history by jumping too quickly to the New Testament. But I have read the New Testament. Um, and, there will be, and there will be one or two references to it tomorrow, uh, God willing, as well. Right, big picture summary of where we're going today in book five. Uh, do you remember that in Jeremiah 33, uh, the, there are five unconditional covenants that converge in their fulfillment? Can somebody in second year please remind us what those five covenants are? Five unconditional covenants that converge in their fulfillment according to Jeremiah 33. Be brave. Abrahamic, <laughs> Noahic, Davidic, Davidic. Levitical, Levitical. New. new, excellent, excellent. Well, we, in book five, <laughs> in book five and uh, the, the concluding doxology, this is what we see. Uh, that these covenants converge. We have the, the, the confirmation of that, uh, if you like, although it is particularly the Abrahamic, Davidic, and new. And, and that's exactly what we'd expect when we realize that the new covenant formula of Jeremiah 33, uh, give thanks to Yahweh for he is good, for his covenant loyalty endures forever, when we realize that that formula is the refrain of Book five. So uh, we are at an Anglican college, so please stand up. And in order to enter into the spirit of book five, uh, from time to time I may say, Hodu Ladonai Kitov, and you will answer, <laughs> you will answer, Ki Lo'olam Hasdo. Give thanks to Yahweh for he is good, for his covenant loyalty endures forever. It's shorter in Hebrew, save time. Ki le'olam hasdo. Can you just repeat? Ki le'olam hasdo. Hodu l'adonai ki tov. Okay. And the other refrain of book five, stay standing. The other <laughs> refrain of book five is hallelujah, praise Yah, Yahweh. And a good response to that that would chime in with book five would be, Hallelu et shem Adonai. Hallelu et shem Adonai. Hallelujah. Excellent. You may sit down. <laughs> Point one. Point one on the handout, convergence of the Abrahamic and New Covenants in their fulfillment. As even an editorial critical skeptic can readily acknowledge, I'm talking about John Goldingay again, there is a clear link between the end of book four and the beginning of book five. I invite you to uh, observe this, please. Psalm 106, verse 47. Psalm 106, verse 47, the closing verse, uh, given that verse 48 is the concluding doxology for the book. Closing verse of Psalm 106. Save us, Yahweh, our God, and gather us from the nations so that we may give thanks to your holy name and rejoice in your praise. 
And then Psalm 107, verses 1 to 3. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his faithful love endures forever. That's the refrain of the book and also the first verse of the book. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that he has redeemed them from the hand of the foe and has gathered them from the lands, from the east and the west, from the north and the south. Psalm 107 shows us the answer to the exile's prayer in Psalm 106, verse 47. Here, Golden Gate. The description in verse 2 relates to a second exodus, the restoration from exile. This is Psalm 107, verse 2. It assumes that the promises in Isaiah have been fulfilled. The people who experience this restoration are the ones who should take up that conventional declaration in verse 1, given that they are in a position to affirm that it is not merely a conventional declaration, but something that they have proved to be true. That is even clearer, he says, in verse 3. Psalm 106, verse 47, pleaded with Yahweh to gather us from the nations, in effect praying for the fulfillment of the promise of Isaiah 60, verse 4. Verse 3 presupposes that this has happened. Those are the words of an editorial critical skeptic and not those of a scholar who has an axe to grind in the area of of Salter shape. I come back to my point that I'm wanting to build only on what is clear and uncontroversial in relation to the structure of the Psalter. Why are these observations important for our purposes? Well, what Golden Gate terms there a conventional declaration bespeaks new covenant fulfillment. I refer you again to Jeremiah 33, verse 11. We've already had occasion to comment on this important formula several times. And we have just uh, been uh, saying it to one another. Uh, But here in Book 5, it takes on particular significance, for it reverberates through the book in a crescendo pattern. And you could discover that as you uh, read Psalms 118 and 136. And it may be considered the book's refrain. I thought about giving you my structure uh, for this book, but I wouldn't want you to gain the impression that it mattered for our purposes. For irrespective of the precise structure one discerns in the book, the prominence of this formula strikes the Psalter reader. In other words, the notions of the return to the land and the realization of the new covenant, which are two sides of the same coin, pervade this final book of the Psalter. This observation that new covenant fulfillment is to the fore in book five is given emphasis if, as is our conviction, Psalm 107 is programmatic for the book. But this point of view is not generally found in the literature, and I'm not going to set store by it in our discussion. So if you have new covenant fulfillment, you have Abrahamic and Davidic covenant fulfillment with it. This comes out within book five in Psalm 118, and it's immediately preceding context, and in Psalm 136, and its immediately preceding context. We don't have time to look at both. So given those time constraints, we'll examine only the second of these, um, except that, since I promised this yesterday, except for a couple of paragraphs, which you can read later on because they're in the handout, on the expression, those who fear Yahweh, in Psalms 115 to 118. And if... uh, Uh, You're not motivated um, to to do that. All I'm wanting to argue there is that that uh, phrase, those who fear Yahweh, encompasses folk from outside Israel. Those who fear Yahweh encompasses folk from outside Israel. I'll leave you to read that uh, if you'd like uh, later on. So we're now jumping to Psalm 136. And you can see straight away uh, in verse 1 there our new covenant formula. And here we find that the fulfillment of the new covenant in the event of the new exodus entails the fulfillment of the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants. 
The full form of the formula is found only once in, in verse 1, but its short form subsequently appears in every verse of the psalm. In other words, Yahweh's eternal chesed is celebrated with remarkable insistence and vigor. The cause for this celebration includes his lordship and work in creation and providence, verses 2 to 9 and 25. But it's the exodus that takes pride of place, not only the departure from Egypt, but also the arrival in Canaan, verses 10 to 22. As one might expect at this stage, it is the new exodus and post-exilic return to the land that we should have in mind. Why? Well, uh, there's one, the refrain itself. Uh, two, the fact that the historical survey ends with the first arrival in the land. The Psalter reader is conscious of a new return uh, to the land from the opening of book five. And three, it's particularly verses 23 and 24 that suggest this recapitulation. For here, the first person plural bursts into the psalm, taking over from third person singular. This is the voice of a later generation. And all the signs point to it being the post-exilic generation. Indeed, this is the same phenomenon as the one we have already seen at the end of Psalm 106, an historical psalm that exhibits affinities with Psalm 136, third person referring to Yahweh and the people, gives way to first person plural, the first person plural of that prayer. Save us, O Lord, and gather us from the nations. Psalm 106, verse 47. You could also check out Psalm 106, verse 6. We've already seen that these are the people who experienced the new exodus of Psalm 107. Further, it's instructive to observe how a second refrain in Psalm 107 connects with Psalm 106 and anticipates Psalm 136. We read four times, then they cried to Yahweh, this is Psalm 107, four times in that psalm, then they cried to Yahweh in their distress, Batsar, and he delivered them. This recalls Psalm 106, verse 44. He looked upon their distress, batzar, uh, which refers to the many times when Yahweh delivered them, verse 43 of Psalm 106. Not only do these observations reinforce the parallel between the new exodus and the prior deliverances, but they also invite us to discern a similar recapitulation in Psalm 136. Uh, verse 24, Yahweh freed us from our adversaries, mitzarenu, homonym of the word in Psalms 106 and 107, just as he had done at the time of the exodus from Egypt, verses 10 to 15. Again, verse 23, he remembered us in our low estate, just as he had previously done many times, including during the exodus from Egypt. And we should note the use of zakar, remember, in this context uh, in Psalm 105, verse 8 and verse 42, as we saw yesterday. The context that precedes Psalm 136 confirms this interpretation. The concatenation or chain linking that runs through the sequence of Psalms 134 to 136 is striking. I'd, I'd encourage you to do the work on that. Just, just see how 134 moves to 135 and how 135 moves to 136. Um, you may even have had the experience, if you do read um, the, the, the Psalms uh, sequentially, um, and in my day we had Bible reading commitments at Moore College. Does that still exist? Um, is that a yes? No. Sorry. Well, sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm getting myself into trouble here. Um, sorry, I'm getting... Sorry, that wasn't in the notes at all. Um, um, if you do read um, the Psalms uh, sequentially, uh, you, will have, you may have this sort of experience. So you, you're, you're reading Psalm 136, and you read uh, Sion, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and you say to yourself, I thought I just read that um, in the previous psalm. And the answer is, well, yes, you did. Um, and not just that, but lots of, uh, uh, lots of um, uh, elements of Psalm 135 that are 
incorporated in Psalm 136. And the, the same phenomenon um, for the, the Psalms that it's 135 compared to 134. Um, and then 134 is the last of the Songs of the Ascents, and they just, it, you, you can trace it back through. Uh, but anyway, that's, um, let's get back on track. Um, the context that precedes Psalm 136 confirms this uh, interpretation. The concatenation or chain linking that runs through the sequence of Psalms 134 to 136 is striking and impressive and serves to point up the tightness of connection between the songs of ascents, Psalms 120 to 134, and the two Psalms that follow. The exhortation to praise Yahweh in Psalm 135, for he is good, in accordance with the New Covenant formula, is grounded in essentially the same truths as in Psalm 136. His lordship, including over creation, so this is Psalm 135, verses 5 to 7, verses 15 to 18, and especially his delivering of his chosen people in the Exodus, verse 4, verses 8 to 14. It should be noted that the beginning and end of the Psalm, verses 1 to 2 and 21, throw the spotlight on the presence of Yahweh in the temple and the presence of worshippers in Jerusalem. Psalm 135 replays the short preceding psalm, the last song of ascents, Psalm 134, in these regards. In this book five setting, the Psalter reader cannot understand House of Yahweh as simply designating a pre-exilic structure. For the songs of ascents showcase Zion as the terminus of a journey or probably several journeys, whose starting point is not Egypt. Rather, these journeys begin in Meshech and Kedar, Psalm 120, verse 5, which are both far from Jerusalem and far from one another. The former is to the northwest and the latter to the south and east. It makes sense to understand these places in terms of a merism that metaphorically conveys the totality of faraway locations where exiles are scattered amongst the nations. But they undertake the journey to their homeland and they end up arriving in Zion, ultimately gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, Psalm 107 verse 3. What indications are there that the new exodus on view in Psalm 136 encompasses non-Jews in line with the Abrahamic covenant? In Psalm 135, verse 20, we come across the phrase, those who fear Yahweh. The people in question are called upon to bless him, for Yahweh is good, verse 3, and so they need to be seen as being of a peace with those who are called upon to praise Yahweh, for he is good, two verses later, at the beginning of the twin psalm that follows, Psalm 136, verse 1. Since several verses of Psalm 115 fetch up in Psalm 135, we would need to have a good reason to exclude non-Israelites from the scope of the expression here. In Psalm 115, the, exam the psalmist exhorts those who fear Yahweh to put their trust in him, verse 11, and declares that Yahweh will bless those who fear Yahweh, whereas in Psalm 135, this group is exhorted to bless Yahweh, verse 20, same verb, uh, expressed in terms of the logic of the two psalms that immediately precede Psalm 135, they should bless Yahweh because they themselves are beneficiaries of Yahweh's blessing. Same verb again, and that blessing, Baraka, being Psalm 133, life forever. Bearing in mind again the chain linkage and the sequence running from Psalms 133 to 136 and the fulfillment of the new covenant that is evoked by the return to Zion, we need to recognize that those who fear Yahweh are included in the brothers of Psalm 133, verse one, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. Interesting, in French uh, evangelical piety, we sing that in Hebrew with a, just enough ex explanation in French afterwards to mean that one isn't in violation of 1 Corinthians 14. But um, do, you, do you sing that sometimes in Hebrew in Hinematovumanaim Shevedachim Gamyachad? Do you ever 
that's okay. It's, it must be something peculiar to the part of the world that uh, I serve in. In Psalm 133, the, uh, a number of covenantal strands come together. And for our purposes, a consideration of this psalm is peculiarly illuminating. What lies behind the language and concepts of verse 1 is Israelite obedience to the Sinaitic covenant as set forth in Deuteronomy. That covenant required that the Israelites choose life, blessing, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. This life is synonymous with Yahweh himself, and the blessing is identified with the realization of the Abrahamic promise concerning the land. But life, blessing, could be attained only if Yahweh's commandments were kept. I remind you, I'll read um, Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 and 20. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give them. This is precisely what was out of reach for the Israelites under the Sinaitic Covenant. Owing to their rebellion, the people couldn't obtain life, blessing, patently. With the advent of the exile, the Abrahamic promise concerning the land was far from being fulfilled. As indicated a couple of days ago, Deuteronomy 30 does, however, specify that in the event of exile, a return to the land would still be in prospect and once circumcised of heart, the people would live and enjoy blessing. Psalm 133 depicts the unity of all who receive blessing, life, from Yahweh at Zion, verse 3. It presupposes a return from exile. Unlike the first experience of occupying the land, this scenario is permanent, ad ha'olam. Verse 3. This implies that both that the Abrahamic promises find fulfillment, which includes blessing for the nations, of course, and that the Sinaitic conditionality is observed, or at least is no longer an obstacle. To be sure, the psalm does not spell out a link between the unity it celebrates and the circumcision of the heart. But Psalm 119, which precedes the Songs of Ascents, seems to presuppose this spiritual circumcision predicted in Deuteronomy 30 and reiterated by the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel in relation to the new covenant. Hodu Ladonai Kitov! Hallelujah! work to do for next time. <laughs> we should not, however, avoid the complexities of the long Psalm 119. And its length uh, being associated, you may be aware, uh, with uh, an anecdote that uh, is probably uh, apocryphal, at least to some degree, uh, concerning um, a minister in the 18th century at a place called Haworth in, in England, uh, William Grimshaw, uh, who um, was said to uh, prescribe the singing of Psalm 119 by his choir quite regularly because that uh, gave him time to exit uh, the, the church uh, before the sermon and he would go out with a stick uh, and a horse whip and uh, round up any uh, stragglers who should have been um, in church, anyone idling around in the churchyard or in the, in the pubs and, and so on. And they were absolutely terrified of him, apparently. Uh, and he would whip them into, the ch into church. And of course, he could go all the way around the town, given how long Psalm 119 uh, is. And so more people could hear the gospel. Good pastoral wisdom. <laughs> it cannot be said of this psalm that it amounts to a wholesale 
fulfillment of the new covenant, since its author is exposed to persecution, for example, verses 81 to 88. In fact, the psalmist seems to represent the pilgrim who undertakes that journey portrayed in the Songs of Ascents. From the beginning of the psalm, the way, verse 1, to the end, verse 176, straying like a lost sheep. His attitude to the Torah is expressed in terms of movement. On the other hand, the circumstances envisaged by Psalms 133 to 136 are those of the journey's end in Zion. For example, 128 verse 5. The new covenant formula of Jeremiah 33 and book 5 is found on the lips of those who have arrived there. Psalm 133 verse uh, 3 and who, Sham, and, and who have even come to the house of uh, Yahweh. Jeremiah 33, 11, Psalm 134, verse 1, Psalm 135, verse 2. In keeping with the sequence of Psalms 120 to 134, it seems that we can affirm that the new exodus to which the journey seems to correspond is not realized in a punctiliar fashion, but is staggered over a period during which the former exile's condition is ambiguous. Indeed, it seems necessary to speak of a restoration of the fortunes for the land and the people in a Jeremiah 33 sense, which is inaugurated and consummated only some time later. We see this tension between interim and final fulfillment in Psalm 126. Zion's fortunes have been restored, verse 1, yet prayer is made for further restoration of fortunes, verse 4. Or again, in Psalm 130 terms, forgiveness has been attained, Psalm 130, verse 4, but Israel must nurture the hope of plentiful redemption, still to come, verses 5 to 8. During this ambiguous period, fulfillment of both the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant is in progress and on track. This means that more and more people drawn from the nations learn of Yahweh. Proclamation of Yahweh's great acts is made amongst the nations during this period. Evangelism, Psalm 126, verse 2. It also means that these representatives of the nations make the journey to Zion. Indeed, the Psalter reader who is immersed in the theology of the latter prophets may react to Psalm 122, verse 1, let us go to the house of Yahweh, by recalling... Isaiah 2, verse 3, and Micah 4, verse 2. The prophets had predicted that the nations would stream to Jerusalem following the exile, and in particular, that they would express their intention to go to the temple, Halak, in these three texts. So the nations participating uh, in this new exodus. Davidic covenant fulfilled, so this is the next heading, uh, with conditionality satisfied, Psalm 132, an important psalm for our project. Psalm 136 also evokes the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. The preceding context is, again, important here. Five of the songs of ascents contain a title whose approximate meaning is relating to a recapitulated or new or eschatological David or Solomon. I hope you've had a chance to read that um, little explanation I give of, of David in context following Psalm 72, verse 20, uh, and I hope you're going to be coming back to me to suggest improvements there. More directly, Psalm 132 refers to the Davidic covenant. Psalm 132 stands out within the Songs of Ascents in the context of this group, its peculiar length and content strike the reader. At the same time, it coheres with the rest of the group by virtue of its concern for the city of Zion as Yahweh's desired dwelling place, verse 13, and the locus of his blessing, verses 15 and 16. Indeed, if our earlier discussion is correct, this psalm precedes a sequence of four that present the final fulfillment of the new covenant and the Abrahamic covenant as going hand in hand with the end of the journey. Psalm 132, verses 7 and 8, anticipate the arrival in Zion. Let us go, arise, O Lord, 
and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. These verses are a throwback to the transfer of the Ark of the Covenant from uh, Kiriath Jearim to Jerusalem, narrated in 2 Samuel 6. A few verses later, in Psalm 132, verse 11, we read of the dynastic promise corresponding to 2 Samuel 7. The Lord has sworn to David a truth from which he will not turn back. Of the fruit of your body, I will set upon your throne. It seems that Yahweh's commitment to Zion as his own dwelling place needs to be associated with the Davidic covenant. Forever, in verse 12, referring to the Davidic throne, finds a parallel in verse 14, where the same phrase refers to Yahweh's resting place. From the standpoint of this psalm, the permanent establishment of Zion as Yahweh's dwelling is thus indissolubly linked to the permanent establishment of David's throne. Given, as we have seen, that Psalms 133 to 136 present the culmination of the new exodus and resultant state of affairs in Zion by way of definitive response to the exile, and given, therefore, that Yahweh's presence in Zion is perpetual, it follows that these Psalms also presuppose the parallel reality, namely, that the oath sworn to David is fulfilled. Indeed, these four psalms probably reflect the realization of the promises in the closing verses of Psalm 132. Here I will dwell, verse 14. Uh, Verse 15, I will abundantly bless her provisions. Uh, 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 Verse 16, her godly ones will sing aloud for joy. Verse 18, his enemies I will clothe with shame. Compare those Uh, statements with what you find in the Psalms that follow. Even if there's no explicit explicit linkage between verse 17 and the four Psalms that follow, it wouldn't be possible to understand that the promise of this verse concerning a horn for David, a lamp for Yahweh's Messiah, could be set aside. Perhaps, though, there is an implicit parallel that the Psalter reader should discern between the there of the end of Psalm 132 and the there of the end of Psalm 133, Sham in both cases designating Zion in both cases. Psalm 132 verse 17, there I will cause a horn to sprout up for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed one. Psalm 133 verse 3, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing life forevermore. If this is right, the Messiah may be considered the channel that Yahweh employs to bestow the blessing. Either way, the praise to which worshippers of Yahweh are called in Psalm 136 does not bypass the realization of the Davidic covenant. Now, you'll remember that the conditional dimension of the Davidic covenant is not mentioned in Psalm 89. Psalm 132 does include it. Verse 12, if your sons keep my covenant and the statutes I teach them, then their sons shall sit on your throne forever and ever. If, this if has the power to explain the exile and thus roll back some of the perplexity of the psalmist at the end of book three. But the preceding verse 11b must remain valid. Of the fruit of your body, I will set upon your throne. The juxtaposition of these two verses implies that the dynastic promise, though inviolable, will come to realization only in a Messiah who upholds the stipulations of the Sinaitic covenant, compare Psalm 101, and the character of the new David as presented in Book 5 and discussed below, and compare also Nick O'Neill's first question. Psalm 132, verse uh, 17 corroborates our reading by virtue of its allusion to Jeremiah 33, verse 15. Again, you have this on the handout. Psalm 132, verse 17. There I will cause a horn to sprout up for David, Jeremiah 33, 15. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to sprout up for David, and he will administer justice and righteousness in the land. 
Psalm 132 thus indicates how two apparently contradictory notions can be reconciled. The Sinaitic conditionality that we find, for example, in Psalm 78 and the Davidic unconditionality of Psalm 89 are not ultimately at variance with one another. Although new covenant newness is partly defined relative to the Sinaitic covenant whose conditionality is removed for a people who could never observe it, that conditionality is not taken away as such. On the contrary, without, without its being satisfied, the new covenant would never prove to be fulfilled. It is imperative that the law be kept, Nick O'Neill. Only a perfectly obedient Messiah will suffice. Psalm 132, which responds to Psalm 89 more directly than any other individual psalm, ends on the confident note that the Davidic crown that, that uh, had been described in Psalm 89 as defiled in the dust will be restored. Psalm 132, verse 18. If it be asked why the king should be only implicitly present in Psalms 133 to 136, the answer may lie with the aim that the redactor compiler of the Psalter has in mind in relation to his post-exilic readership. For uh, these readers had access to the temple in Jerusalem, but there was no king. Although Psalms 133 to 136 bespeak the final fulfillment of the new covenant, the post-exilic community would have been able to appropriate their content ahead of time, seeking to put into practice the ideal set forth in Psalm 133, where brothers live together in unity, and the calls to praise in Psalms 134 to 136. That would mean that Psalms 119 through to 136 would have a similar aim to that of Chronicles, in terms of inciting the post-exilic returnees to seek the consummation of the kingdom against the background of a rebuilt temple, but a Messiah whose arrival needed to be anticipated. But we shouldn't shy away from the fact that Zion and Messiah are twin concepts in Psalm 132. And nor should we underestimate the imposing presence of the new David in two groups of Le David Psalms 108 to 110 and 138 to 145. We are at Roman 4 on the handout. We've already advanced reasons why the Psalter reader is led to focus on an eschatological David and not simply the David of the generation immediately following uh, Jesse. Well, at least I hope you've had a chance to, uh, to have a look at, at that material uh, that I asked you to read towards the end of yesterday. The absence of historical information relating to that David of 1000 BC is noteworthy given the number of Book 5 Psalms that carry Le David in the title. It's all the more striking that these Psalms echo, since these Psalms echo the sufferings and achievements of David, son of Jesse, especially as presented in Book 2 Psalms, many of whose titles do contain historical notes. Psalm 140, for example, recalls five Davidic Psalms from Book 2. And parts of Psalms 57 and 60 come together to form Psalm 108. I'm going to leave you to read uh, that next uh, part there, um, which argues for a ratcheting up uh, in the new David relative to David, son of Jesse. This is the way typology works, is it not? Um, ratcheting up both with regard to victory and with regard to suffering. And we're going to jump now to the heading uh, King Combined with Righteous Suffering Servant. Book five stands out from books one and two in an important respect. We are not told that David suffers as a result of his sin. In book one, David's sin problem emerges explicitly in a section seemingly delimited by the alphabetic acrostics, uh, Psalms uh, 25 and 34. 
And it becomes more sustained and pronounced in the final section of that book. So if you were to read through Psalms uh, 38 to 40, you would see that. And then in book two, the problem is further accentuated from the outset as David the adulterer and murderer appears in the first Le David Psalm, Psalm 51. But the David of book five calls to mind the David stroke Solomon of the first two books who is a moral paragon. Psalms 18, 45, 72. Certain texts might suggest at most that he could in principle have sinned against Yahweh uh, in Psalms 139, 141, 143. But even these verses form part of the picture of a David who is concerned to be beyond reproach. And none of these Psalms indicates that he is guilty despite his suffering. It is true that 143 verse 2, no one living is righteous before Yahweh. But this figure belongs nonetheless to the category righteous. He is loving, to, uh, as you can see in Psalms 140, 142. He is loving towards enemies who attack him gratuitously, Psalm 109. He looks to know the, the will of the God he worships so as to put it into practice being led by Yahweh's good spirit, Psalm 143. The Psalter reader's mind is drawn to the righteous David of Psalm 18. Indeed, the David of Psalm 18 comes to be on display in Psalm 144, to which we'll return as book five draws to a close. Taking account of the fact that he is described four times as the servant Eved, of Yahweh in, in, in book five, might it not be right to discern here in the righteous David who suffers unjustly, the suffering servant figure who has, I've got written here, already emerged from our study of Psalm 102, but we didn't get time to look at that. Um, you haven't had a chance to see my working there, um, but uh, I believe it is um, uh, robust. Uh, that we see the Isaiah 53 uh, uh, figure uh, emerging in Psalm 102, and I suspect that we are uh, uh, right to uh, see him as such in Book 5 as well. The combination of king and servant um, is also detected in Psalm 118, but again, we haven't had time to go into that. The Levitical covenant fulfilled by a superior priesthood, and here we arrive at the key Psalm 110 that George uh, read for us. The Psalms that conclude these Le, Le David groups, that's Psalm 110 and 144 and 145, appear to have climactic significance and are of particular importance in terms of elucidating the newness of the new covenant. Their placement coheres with that of other psalms that are structurally prominent and that are royal and or deal with matters of covenant relationships. Psalms 2, 45, 72, 89, and then 103 to 106. In keeping with the perspective of Psalm 2, the king of Psalm 110 rules in Zion, is absolutely victorious over his enemies, crushing kings on the day of wrath. The ambu ambiguity in verse 5, whose wrath is it? Is it Yahweh's wrath or is it the king's wrath? Well, that recalls again Psalm 2 and other portraits of the new covenant king. The clear distinction between Yahweh and the psalmist's Lord is evident in verse 1, but not in verses 5 and 6. Whilst these two figures operate in harmony, Ultimate authority lies with Yahweh. It's he who delegates power to the king and installs him as priest forever by an irrevocable oath. Verse 4. So let's just uh, uh, reread that. Verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You remember that in our discussion of Psalm 106, we highlighted the need that emerges from the relentless repetition of the cycle of human sin followed by divine wrath. The need for intercession that is total in its scope, 
that's permanent in its effectiveness and that is sin-free in its administration. We also noted that Psalm 106 reaffirms the Levitical covenant, which provides for a pe perpetual priesthood. Well, with a greater or lesser degree of directness, these themes come together in Psalm 110. Here is the mediator who is superior to Moses and Phinehas. The significance of the new order of priesthood, that of Melchizedek, isn't spelt out, but Yahweh's oath does draw attention to its permanence. Verse 4. That this priest attains total forgiveness is an idea consistent with the fact that he is simultaneously the king who fulfills a key role in the new exodus for the link between total pardon and the new exodus is established by Psalm 130, Psalm 130 verses 3 and 4. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Under the old Sinaitic covenant, it was unthinkable that the two offices of king and priest could be combined in one person. You just check out 2 Chronicles 26 and see what happens to uh, uh, Isaiah, is it, uh, uh, and uh, how he ends up having to uh, lead the, the rest of his uh, reign uh, in splendid isolation and let his, king, his uh, son uh, act as king. This Perpetual priesthood forms part of a radically new regime that appears both to fulfill and transcend the exigencies of the Levitical covenant, covenantal order. We had a question around about here yesterday, but the person's probably sitting somewhere else uh, now. Um, the problem of sin of Genesis 3 to 11, which according to book four is bound together with the problem of the exile, you remember, finds its solution as David's Zerah seed combines the functions of priesthood and kingship. The Levitical covenant needs to reach fulfillment alongside that of the Davidic covenant, even if the principal considers it uh, to be a covenant with a small C. Um, exactly as our reading of book four indicated. The structurally prominent Psalm 110 does seem to respond to the concerns of the structurally prominent Psalm 106, which in turn has already paved the Abrahamic way towards a solution to the crisis of Psalm 89. Are we not led to proclaim it? Hodu ladonai ki tov! Hallelujah! Thank you. Yet Psalm 110 does not bear the full weight of this king-priest theme within the Psalter. In addition to the intercessory role carried out by the servant of Psalm 102, he was also the king of Psalm 101, but unfortunately we didn't have time to get into that. And in addition to the way in which the uh, pedagogy of failure device from Psalm 106 anticipates the superior priesthood, it may well be that the end of Psalm 132 points to a sacerdotal role for the Messiah, but I'm going to leave that to one side for now. It's quite technical and quite long. Under this new regime, it seems that the priesthood is democratized. I'm going to leave that aside as well. Uh, blessings democratized. Now, Psalm 144. It will be recalled that in Psalm 18, the historical David enjoys some considerable measure of the fulfillment of promises that apply to his son and that ultimately go hand in hand with the realization of the new covenant. Those are those four paragraphs I asked you to read on Monday. Psalm 18 has pride of place amongst the Psalms that are picked up in Psalm 144. I may not have emphasized it sufficiently. In book five, there are a number of composite Psalms, okay? So Psalms that are picking up material from earlier on in the Psalter and elsewhere in scripture um, 
and that this seems to go hand in hand with the way in which Psalm uh, Book 5 presents this new eschatological uh, David. And what's uh, picked up particularly in Psalm 144 is Psalm 18. Here in Book 5, a transposition occurs. Despite some ambiguity, the data of Psalm 18 required us to view the that book one psalm as anchored in the Davidic covenant. As we mentioned, or if you read the paragraphs, it doesn't, for example, reflect the democratization relative to the Davidic covenant that characterizes the new covenant of Isaiah 55 or Psalm 2. Here, however, in Psalm 144, that democratization is clearly on view. Having given salvation to kings, and in particular to David, his servant, Yahweh recapitulates his salvific action on behalf of the speaker. Verse 11, the new David. Uh, sorry, there may be uh, that. I fear that verse 11 may be Hebrew, but um, you can work it out. Um, the new David of the heading, which gives rise to uh, covenantal uh, blessings uh, for the community of Yahweh's people, um, verses 12 to 15. But I'm just going to check this. Um, yes. The, these verses, uh, 12 to 15, with which the psalm uh, climaxes, evoke the blessings of the Sinaitic covenant as enumerated in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. These blessings prove to be unattainable under that regime, but the new covenant provides the solution. Significantly, and I love this, there is no danger of a return to the curses of the Sinaitic covenant. A second exile is ruled out, as we read in verse 14. No breach, no going out. Now, that doesn't seem to come out in... Oh, it's not bad in the, in the uh, footnote uh, of the ESV, if you're using the ESV like myself. Um, no breach, no going out. Book five thus concludes ahead of its doxology in the following psalm with the perspective of the fulfillment of the new covenant, the people enjoying the blessings of prosperity and security. Verses... 12 to 14 have a different character from the rest of the psalm, but are reminiscent of texts such as Amos 9, 11 to 15, Psalm 72, verse 16, and Psalm 132, verses 13 to 15, which reflect the convergence between the fulfillment of the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenants. The double use of happy in verse 15 takes on a new covenant flavor. And in the light of its counterpart at the other end of the Psalter, Psalm 1.1 and 2.12, confirms our interpretation of Psalm 2 that those who take refuge in the Son are beneficiaries of the new covenant. Perhaps we should even discern in the last clause of the Psalm an equivalent, appropriate for a Psalm praise context of the pan-scriptural covenant formula I will be your God, you will be my people. Happy, we read, happy are the people who have Yahweh as their God. Hallelujah. Psalm 145, which closes book five by way of doxology spotlights the Abrahamic covenant as a reason for ascribing praise to Yahweh, the one who is great and most worthy of praise. Verse 3. The psalm celebrates the rule of Yahweh over his entire creation and his providence in this regard. Yet allusions to his intervention in redemptive history are also apparent. Yahweh is the savior of those who fear him and the destroyer of all the wicked. It's verse 8 that alludes most clearly to the covenant with Abraham. Yahweh is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and great in chesed. 
This formula recalls once again Moses' intercession for the people at the time of the Golden Calf episode and at Kadesh Barnea. Psalms 90 and 106 have already drawn the Psalter reader's attention to the importance of this mediation grounded in the promises to Abraham in terms of offering hope to the wayward exiles. We may recall too that the Exodus 34 6 formula also features in Psalm 103, with which we closed yesterday, which corresponds to the answer to Moses' prayer in Psalm 90. We even came across this formula in Psalm 86, where the Psalter reader can begin to glimpse a brighter future than the exile for Yahweh's people. That book three Psalm, Psalm 86, that book three Psalm is also the one that requires the reader to uh, consider what David might refer to in a post-David son of Jesse context. At this stage in the progressive revelation of the Psalter, it would be difficult to read the chesed affirming Exodus 34, 6 formula in any way other than in terms of response to the crisis of the exile. The psalmist's perplexity regarding the apparent absence of Yahweh's chesed in Psalm 89 is answered in this Abrahamic formula as found in the last Davidic psalm in each of the last three books of the Psalter. That's Psalm 86, 103, and here in Psalm 145. Well, we haven't quite reached the end of the Psalter because there is also uh, the uh, concluding doxology uh, that covers the last five Psalms, and so I'm going to need to ask you to read um, uh, the material there. But you can see from the title, as ever, for the material this week, um, the titles do the work for you. And so the essence of what you find with regard to covenant relationships in those concluding Psalms is the convergence of Noahic, Abrahamic, Davidic, and New Covenants. And there... We must leave it for today. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the floor? Over here. If nobody else is asking, let me ask on behalf of my Old Testament 3 class a little question about Psalm 110, if that's all right. <clears throat> Why do you think the priesthood in the order of Melchizedek in that psalm is spelled out in the following verses in terms of the crushing of enemies rather than the forgiveness of sins. Just to repeat the question, why is the, the priesthood of Melchizedek defined in terms of crushing kings as opposed to forgiveness of sins? Thank you, Andrew. Uh, are not uh, salvation and judgment two sides of the same coin? You're surrendering the microphone there, Andrew? Yes? Okay. Thank you. Are there other questions? Over here. Thank you, James. Um, my question is just about the New Covenant um, anticipation in Book 5. There seems to be a bit of ambiguity over whether it's happened, uh, praise the Lord because it's happened, and whether it will happen. Can you just talk a bit about that? So the question is... Is there some ambiguity over when the new covenant is fulfilled? Does the, does the Psalter see it as past or as future? That's uh, very perceptive and, and chimes in with what I've been uh, trying, to, trying to present. Um, there are times when it's uh, presented as, as fully and finally, definitively um, uh, fulfilled. Um, and yet you come to realize uh, in uh, the experience of the psalmist in the long Psalm 119, uh, that he is far from uh, experiencing. So I think you've got both going on. Um, there are sometimes um, expressions of that final fulfillment that corresponds, if, if you like, if we can cheat a little bit now that we've reached the end of the Psalter, corresponds to the, the, the new cosmos for, for us. Um, and there are other times when it corresponds to 
um, uh, life as it is now for, for us, if you, if you, if you like, um, and which is not very different from life uh, as it would have been for the original recipients of the, of the Psalter as a Psalter. Um, and so persecution, difficulty, um, and the, uh, the, that, that uh, long uh, uh, group m moving from Psalm 120 through to 134 or beyond, depending on how much of the linkage you want to um, value, um, corresponds to the, uh, the, the journey that I think we can say um, we are on, um, except for the last three or four, where it's, it's a matter of the, the, the journey having come to an end and, and you're in, into final fulfillment. So it's a particularly precious book for us. We haven't talked about, much about uh, appropriating the book uh, Christianly uh, at this stage, but um, it, you've um, hit the nail on the head. And uh, you can imagine how beneficial it would be to preach a psalm like uh, psalm 130, which speaks of forgiveness, but also speaks of plentiful redemption still to come. Uh, to uh, a, a congregation in 2018 of, of, of believers. Uh, James, to what extent do you think there is scope for Psalm 110 to be uh, in situ uh, a justification of the importance of the Davidic covenant over the Aaronic covenant? That... Ironic, the, the covenant with Aaron and his sons, that because the Messiah, who happens to lead the dedication of the temple uh, and lead the worship of Israel as the ark is brought into Jerusalem, is there any scope for that Psalm 110 justifying the importance of David as a leader of worship over Aaron? Does Psalm 110 justify Davidic leadership within worship and uh, what goes on in the temple? over and against the covenant with Aaron and the Levites. My understanding, um, David, of, of Psalm 110 is that it's uh, a new covenant scenario uh, where you have the fulfillment both of the Levitical covenant and of the Davidic covenant coming together. We had a question yesterday about the different, uh, the, the, the non-parallel nature of the fulfillment of those two covenants but it seems to me that if you've got king and priest in uh, the the one person as you have there in a new regime you must be saying that this is the davidic covenant fulfilled rather than the davidic covenant itself and i take issue with craig blazing who was model five if you can remember that from last thursday evening um who considers um, perhaps as your question might have been suggesting considers psalm 110 to be Davidic covenant. I consider it to be new covenant. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, James. Um, I have the same question as yesterday. Um, so you've, you've talked about how the, the Levitical covenant has been transcended and fulfilled in Jesus. I think I'm still struggling with the, maybe I'm being too literal, but the idea that he says that, you know, to Aaron, you and your sons will never cease to have somebody serving before me. Is there some sort of weird genealogical thing where, because Jesus is in the womb of, you know, all that sort of stuff, like, I, yeah, I'm trying to figure out what's going on there with the literal language. So if I can paraphrase the question, how does... Uh, Jesus in some way fulfill the permanence of the Levitical covenant. Thank you. Um, I don't know how far I can get um, in, in, answering, in answering that. You kind of want to, to, to dig deeply in um, Hebrews 7 uh, and so forth, particularly for that early part of the chapter that you were uh, alluding to, which is very difficult. Um, but what's clear is that in order for uh, the Levitical covenant to, uh, to reach its fulfillment in the new covenant, you need permanence. That comes out in Hebrews 7. You need someone who can be there permanently uh, operating as a priest. And if I, again, because we can now be freed up to talk more about the New Testament, um, we have one who intercedes for us at the right hand of the Father. Um, and the fact that we um, 
have sinned many times today uh, doesn't mean we're out of relationship with our loving Heavenly Father because uh, Jesus does have that mediatorial role uh, in an ongoing uh, kind of way. Um, so uh, that, is, that is ultimately how the Levitical Covenant must uh, come to its uh, telos, uh, if you like, in, in the New Covenant. But I may not be interacting sufficiently with your question. I may not even have understood the full um, freight of uh, your, your question. So maybe we could have a chat or uh, maybe we could even follow it up by email or something. Down the front here. Thanks, James. Um, James, um, you mentioned, I think, unless I misheard you, uh, just before blessings being democratised, uh, that the priesthood is democratised. Um, you didn't. You were passing quickly over that section. Would you like to expand what you mean? What happens within the Psalms that democratises the priesthood? If that, if I heard you correctly, uh, and how that might set us up for the new covenant. The question is, how does the Psalter talk about the democratisation of the priesthood and how does this set us up for the new covenant? That's a sort of dream question that uh, I, I love getting because it's just an invitation for me to cover more material. Um, <laughs> you'll, get a bit, you'll get a better answer if it's coming uh, word for word um, uh, here. Um, Oh, no, this is in French. Um, um, so I'm going to have to do a bit of um, attempt to synthesize this. Um, so um, a new sacerdotal order may be suggested by the invitation to the nations to enter the temple courts in Psalm 100, uh, verse 4, um, apparently the same uh, level as uh, Jews and, and even as Levites. Um, what group is present in the temple in Psalm 118, verse 26? So this is a part of the, um, the argument. Psalm 118, verse 26b. Um, Might it not encompass those who fear Yahweh, verse 3? Uh, and do these uh, people not penetrate as far as the horns of the altar, verse 27. Um, who are the servants of Yahweh who, uh, in verse, uh, Psalm 135, um, are uh, standing in the house of the Lord? Do they not uh, encompass those who fear Yahweh, verse 20 of that same psalm? Um, his servants, verse 14, has as parallel his people defined in a larger sense um, uh, by contrast with the servants of Pharaoh in verse 9. Um, and as for Psalm 134, uh, some consider that servants of Yahweh uh, designates uh, Levites uh, who uh, should be fulfilling uh, their temple functions during the night, but uh, several factors speak in favor of a broader referent, a more general referent, um, that the chain linkage that I spoke about um, between Psalms 134 and 135 is an argument in favor of that. The um, uh, apparently uh, broad designation of the expression uh, servants of Yahweh in, in Psalm 113 verse 1 uh, that finds, is found in a, a similar context to Psalm 134, verse 1, and constitutes a, a parallel text to Psalm 135, verse 1. The presence in Psalm 134, verse 1, of all, kul, um, uh, before the expression, the servants of Yahweh, um, the fact that we are dealing with the uh, climax of the uh, journey to Zion, uh, undertaken by every servant of Yahweh. And then what, what is, so what is the uh, uh, meaning of the, the presence of all the servants in the temple during the nights in Psalm 134 verse 1? Um, seems to me that um, this is speaking of a particular function of priests in the new context 
relating to every servant, um, and that must imply a democratization under the new covenant. Um, the permanent priesthood in the order of Melchizedek, Psalm 110 verse 4, assured by the uh, Messiah of the new regime, um, renders the uh, privileges that are uh, particular to Levites um, null and void. Uh, every worshiper enjoying uh, at every moment access to God in his house. Uh, so we shouldn't be surprised um, that the sacerdotal, um, the Levitical um, priesthood uh, becomes um, uh, uh, null and void. Uh, it's one of the institutions uh, that comes from the Sinaitic covenant that uh, uh, yields uh, to the new covenant. Well, yeah, French is pompous, and that was a bit um, disjointed, but I hope some of the, the key um, ideas came out there. Other questions? Up the back. Uh, thanks, James. This might be a slight follow-on from the previous ones. Um, but in the first four books of the Psalter, uh, Aaron seems to always be mentioned uh, in reference to and alongside Moses, uh, whereas in the, the fifth book we start seeing this uh, reference to a common refrain, uh, bless the Lord, O house of Israel, uh, bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Uh, and then there's even one, I think, bless the Lord, O house of Levi. Can you just speak to the enduring nature of that house and why it seems to be... Um, a particular thing associated with Book 5? So in Books 1 to 4, we see Aaron frequently appearing beside Moses uh, in references. Uh, and in Book 5, we see an appeal to both the House of Israel, but also the House of Aaron, who are both called to praise, praise the Lord. And what significance do we read into this? You'll get a better answer from me tomorrow morning. Thank you. Other questions? Well, if I might uh, use my privilege uh, at the microphone uh, to ask a question. Um, James, you mentioned that at one point that Zion and Messiah are twin concepts. Uh, and I wonder whether you've thought about um, the fact that Z uh, Zion is not merely synonymous for Jerusalem and temple, but perhaps also has specifically Davidic overtones, uh, because when in 2 Samuel 5 we see David conquering Jerusalem, the fortress that he conquers uh, is the fortress of Zion, and it's the fortress that he renames City of David, uh, so that when we come to the prophetic books but also uh, the Psalter and we read references to Zion, uh, are we perhaps meant to see not just simply a reference to where the temple is, but also the dynasty that is in some way in charge of that temple. Hmm. And and the and the people. Um, yeah, uh, I take it that Zion uh, comes to be uh, used more and more in a metaphorical sense the further you go through. Uh, scriptural revelation. Uh, I wouldn't deny the, the throwback to, to Samuel 5 and following. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I've, that, that's a, it's a new, uh, a new ish idea for me to, um, to be thinking um, in terms of David. Certainly, uh, one of the big uh, thrusts of this book, and we see it in, in the book of Psalms, and we see it in the programmatic Psalm 2 is that the Messiah must be set on Zion, uh, Yahweh's holy mountain. So that's, that's where we're moving towards, um, set out in the, in the program, and then, and then we, we see it uh, uh, gradually unfolding. So Zion, for a Psalter reader, um, must be associated with uh, the, the new David, at the very least. Final opportunity for questions? Last opportunity, going, going, 
Yes, we have. We have a late bidder. Thanks, James. Um, I noticed the phrase, um, what I have vowed I will pay from Jonah, or from the Psalms in Jonah, occurs throughout the Psalms quite a lot. I've always wondered what that phrase means. Um, do you have any insight into that? Uh, the question is, uh, what does the phrase, what I have vowed I will pay, mean? Uh, it's something that occurs in the Psalter as well as in Jonah. Uh, I, I need to look into that for, for tomorrow morning. Mm. Do, you, do you have any particular psalms in mind there? Um, I've got a list. I've got a list here. Um... Maybe, maybe to save time, you could come and give them to me. Yeah. Those references. Yeah. Thanks.